So we're going to talk about understanding Christian love. Because, you know, the understanding of love from a Christian context can be a little confusing, I think. And sometimes we maybe mix up what we might have been brought up to and taught in society as what love is and what God meant or what Jesus meant when he talks about love. Those things can be different. They might be the same for you. And if that is true, that is great. And you can probably tune out now. But <laughs> um, So the meaning of love in our common vernacular is so generalized that it can mean almost anything at all. People can love their parents, but they can also love a cheesesteak, right? People can say they love God, um, or they can say they love a pet, you know, and are those two things the same? Um, You know, I was reading in the Huffington Post, there's an old article, but I I don't know why I started thinking of it, but there was, um, they did a poll that, People were more, almost as likely to save their 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 dog over their over a random stranger from like an oncoming bus. I, I thought that was interesting. Um, I don't know what that says about our society, but um, I think it, in particular, the way that we think about and value human life, um, you know, might have something to say about that. But love, as a word in our language can mean something very powerful and significant. It can also be a a throwaway word and have no substance at all. And as a Christian, it's critical for us, if we want to be followers of Christ, to understand what Jesus meant uh, when he used the word we translate as love, because love was fundamental to Christ's teaching. Uh, He even made it a new commandment to love one another even as I have loved you, right? Um, So for a Christian, love is the critical foundation upon which our faith and our beliefs are built. And as Paul astutely made an observation in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, without love, he said, I am nothing and I gain nothing. So there's no point to life without love uh, from a Christian's perspective. So understanding what love is in the Christian context is key to understanding our faith. Um, So what I want to do first is discuss what the primary word that is translated as love in our Bible is or what it means. Uh, There are several different words in the Greek language that are translated as love in our Bible and were used as a a translated in love in lots of other classical literature, Greek literature. But one that primarily stands out, and which I'm sure you've heard before, is agape. It is almost always agape. Uh, There's a couple of places where it is brotherly love or um, even (laughs) sensual love, which was actually used as a word for a sin in the Bible. (laughs) Uh, but, But basically, which is called eros anyway, But anyway, almost all the time, we're talking about agape. And according to uh, HELP's word studies, sometimes you you know want to look at what the Greek use you know what the Greek usage meant, Uh, and it means to prefer something. That's what it means. Uh, In ancient antiquity, it meant to show preferential treatment to something. Uh, Through a Christian lens, this would mean to prefer or to show preferential treatment to God. that is to show God preferential treatment in everything that we do. If we love God, then we consider God first and put his concerns before our own. And that is to set aside whatever it is that we want and substitute it instead for what God wants. So in every choice, we choose or make a God choice instead. That's what it means to love. Uh, so let's look at a well-known passage uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-six through forty, um, concerning love in the Bible, and look at its implications when Jesus is saying to prefer God or to put God first. He says, "Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law?" And he said to him, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind." 
And this is the great, great and foremost commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. When Jesus is saying that we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, he's saying that we put first God first in our heart and our mind and our soul. We're preferring God's ways to our own ways in a lot in an emotional sense, right? In a logical and thinking sense and in a spiritual and everlasting sense. So if you think about all the, the facets of who you are as a person, he's saying to love God or prefer God in logic, in, in feeling and emotion, and in your spirit, in the spiritual things. There's nothing in us that does not humble itself to the will and the power of God. There is nothing that a person reserves for themselves they have to be willing to give it all to God. That's what Jesus is saying. This is the greatest commandment, is to hold back nothing. This preferential treatment of God also extends into how we treat other people, like our neighbors, right? The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we understand that we must prefer the will of God in all things, we must also understand that we must love our neighbor as ourselves, as God would have intended us to love him. We should love our neighbor as God loves and not simply giving people what they want, right? Because the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. Love your neighbor like yourself, meaning that how would God want you to treat that person? Not how would they want you to treat them. There's a difference, right? Um, so in the hierarchy or in the tree of understanding of what it is to love somebody, first that is filtered through how we love God. And then it is how we can love a person. So Jesus even explains that whatever we do to the least of these, right, we do, you do unto me, right? That's from the implications from Matthew 25, 40. So how we treat other people, in essence, is how we treat God. How we love others is a way of vicariously loving God, right? So what we can understand from this analysis is that Christian love is not based on anything concerning the self. It is a selfless love. It is an outward love. It is entirely focused on others, on God, on putting others first according to the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And that's a pretty heavy thing when we think about you know, what, what it means to love or what Jesus means when he tells us to love, what he's telling us to do. Uh, this understanding of love also makes sense when we think about other passages of Scripture. Think about, if you will, John 14, uh, 21. It says, the one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. What does this mean? You know, I, when I was a kid and I used to read passages like this, it used to be a feel confusing to me because I was feeling. I was saying, well, isn't love like a Valentine's card and a Twitter patient and this kind of warm feelingness? Well, when you read about the one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, you don't really feel the warmness, right? It's about an obedience thing. It's about a submission of the will uh, to the will of God. It's, it's, it's a strange thing. It's a strange feeling and when you apply what our modern understanding or concept of love is. But it is not so strange when we think about what Jesus meant by what it is to love somebody. Jesus tells us that the one who keeps God's commandments is the one who really loves God, the one who really prefers God's way to their own, and the one who will be loved by God. If love has anything to do with warm feelings, this wouldn't make a lot of sense. So we will be remembering um, Renny Renew uh, in a couple of weeks. And the first thing that I remember about Renny is that uh, he used to come on Wednesday night Bible class uh, pretty, pretty regularly, pretty faithfully. Uh, and he would always quote this verse from John 14, 15. If you love me, then keep my commandments. <laughs> he, would, he would say that all the time. And that was so important to him, and I think important to him in his own life, and his own experience and relationship with God. Um, 
That is how Rennie tried to live his life. And I think he mentioned that verse so often because people today, a lot of times they don't think outwardly about love. People do not think of God. They don't think about obedience and righteousness of a whole person, of giving everything to God when they think about what does love mean to me. I think it's very often the case that people unfortunately think a lot about themselves, how they feel, how something that the Bible tells them makes them feel, what makes them happy, what they desire. Instead of preferring God and his knowledge and wisdom for their life, they prefer themselves, right? When people are dissatisfied dissatisfied with the words of the Bible, it is because they're inclined to follow their own desire rather than the will of God. They don't really love what God says. They don't want to make it part of their life. They're holding back. Uh, they're holding back something for themselves. I think what Rennie was doing when he was quoting uh, John fourteen fifteen, he was reminding us that the Bible cl- in the Bible class that obedience to God was loving God. Uh, he was reminding us that the world doesn't revolve around us. It doesn't revolve around our feelings, that everything, that the universe, uh, everything that is, is belongs to God. There's greater and bigger things than, than we are. We're all part of God's glorious and masterful plan. We all have our own little place in the universe that he designed us to fill. And he has a, a, a plan for us. Uh, to fill that. It says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. Trying to find a little kid work in there. (laughs) But uh, shovel in the driveway is very relatable. It will be in a couple of months. We're in the burrs already. Been seeing that uh, on the internet, the burr months. September is not bad, though. It says, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's God designed us for a purpose, a purpose to do good things in the world, to make a change in the world for the better. God designed each of us with a purpose in mind. We are created to do the good works of God. We are created to spread the love, the wisdom, the knowledge of God uh, through selfless acts, through virtue, through goodness. That's what essentially is meant by loving God. That is, in essence, what a Christian should be concerned with. That is what it means to truly love God. So what does loving God actually look like? What are these virtuous uh, things that we should be concerned about? What are these outward expressions that we should manifest with our own life? Well, I think that Paul really puts it the best, right? Everybody has seen this passage, this chapter, and and it doesn't take long to read it. But it really does a good job describing what love is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and I I use the NIV here. I I don't usually use the NIV, but the reason why I did is because I like the way that it's translated. I think it's better. Uh, in this particular circumstance. There's a couple of word choices that I don't agree with in some of the other translations, but in this one, I think it's it's a better choice. Um, so I'm, that's why I picked it anyway. <laughs> uh, basically, the main one is that uh, the difference between jealousy and envy. Um, I think envy is a better word choice than jealousy. Uh, all right, so 1 Corinthians 13, it says... If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, 
always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So if we take a quick look at what he said, and you could do a lot of sermons on these, right? I mean, you could, uh, but we're going to be very quick about it. <laughs> uh, because I've already talked up here for quite a while, and I'm sure that you're like thinking, 12 is going to be coming soon, right? <laughs> but Paul begins his explanation, verses 1 through 3, of love by telling us that even if we do these fantastic, amazing things, like prophecy, moving mountains, giving all of our possessions to the poor, and look, he, he talks about the fact that you give them away in order to boast. You know, now, what would that be like? That would be like dedicate, giving a, a huge sum of money to the dedication of a project and then having your name placed on it, right? Like if you go to, um, when I went to college, we had this, uh, the football field was called First Security Field because the, the I think it was a credit union or a bank, uh, First Security Credit Union or whatever, gave a substantial sum of money in order for the creation of that football field. Now that is to boast that you gave the most money because your name is on the title of the field, right? So that is a boastful gift. That is to say, you're getting credit for that because you gave that money. And that, that's, that's what that is, right? So is it wrong to do that? Not, not like a sin, but that's not, that's not love because you're, you're deriving some type of benefit from it. It's not really giving something. It's a transactional thing, right? You're, you're giving so that your name can be placed out there in the world and say, hey, look at what this person did. And that's you receiving your own reward for that. That's not what it is to, to love, right? Jesus said, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing when it comes to giving. Right? So that's, that's the difference. Okay? So that's why he says, so that you may boast. Um, but let's look at what love is really all about uh, in the next passage here. It says, love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking and not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes and always perseveres. Paul is describing for us attributes of who God is as a person. When Paul says that these things are love, he is saying that these attributes personify who God is. And when we think about Jesus, right, who also shows us God, right, Jesus reveals God to us, um, we're thinking about the things that make up God, who he is as a person, and that we're accepting those things onto ourselves. If we want to love, then we're going to emulate those things that we see in Jesus and also in God. For example, when, he, when, when Paul talks about love being patient, if we think about a passage from Second Peter 3.9. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, it says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Yes, apocalypse is loading, but it's taking a long time, right? That's what it was. Okay, I'm like, why do I have that on there? I forgot. But that's, he, he's not slow about his promises, right? He's waiting. Uh, <laughs> but he is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, right? God, God wants as many as people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth as possible, Right? Um, so it's loading. But just as God is patient with each of us, uh, we are called to be patient with one another. When we think about the life of Jesus, we see lots of other types of these attributes on display. Like Jesus was kind. How many times did Jesus heal people and even raise people from the dead out of compassion? Um, he didn't envy. Jesus was content with what he had, right? Um, 
He didn't concern himself with the possessions of other people. He didn't try to get their stuff. Jesus wasn't self-seeking. He always put other people before himself. He thought of other people before himself. He even gave his life as a sacrifice uh, to pay for the sins of the many. By his stripes we are healed, as it says in Isaiah 53, right? Jesus gave everything. He gave all so that we could live. Um, Jesus didn't keep a record of wrongs, right? He practiced forgiveness. He taught us that we ought to forgive those who trespass against us, right? That's part of his prayer example. Um, Jesus, through the gift of his life, also protects our souls from destruction. Right? He provided protection for our souls. Jesus trusted in God with every, every last breath, every last breath that he had, down to the last one. And through the power of God, he was raised on the third day. See, Jesus really did truly show us the love of God with everything that he did in his whole life. And then that's why he says, a new commandment I give to you, as right before he goes to the cross, he says, to love one another even as I have loved you. And by this, people will know that you're my disciples. So, love is, for a Christian, living with the mind of Christ. Love is preferring God's ways in everything that we do, making God's ways our own ways. Love is keeping God's commands. Love is putting the needs of others before our own, not giving them what they want, but rather what God would want for them. Right? A righteous and holy life. A relationship with God their eternal souls secured in heaven. I think the key about love is that a lot of people have lost focus on what love means in a Christian context. Many people accuse Christians of not being loving because we don't accept sin. We do not believe that sin defines a person. It doesn't say who they are. We think that people and sin, <laughs> that sins can be forgiven and that we can move past the things that hold us back and the things that separate us from God. We can eliminate them from our life. We refuse to accept the notion that sin is who a person is. And though we show tolerance and treat people with kindness and a gentle spirit, we can never accept something that is evil as being good. We cannot if we claim to love God, which is the first commandment, the most important one. We must lo love what is good and hate what is evil. That's Romans 12, 9, if you want to look that up. We have to believe, all of us, that every person, no matter who, can accept God's love and can incorporate it themselves into their own life, that can Embrace the grace of God and humble themselves under his mighty and powerful hand. It says in uh, John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That pretty much sums up what we've been talking about, and it makes a whole lot of sense now when we've been thinking about it, right? God is love. His works, his commandments are the very essence and definition of what love is for a Christian. And if we do not love as God loves, then we don't truly know who God is. And as we go out into this world this week, let us remember to love people, to love people as God has loved us. Not love as is popular in, in common uh, society and the way people normally understand it, but rather love in the way that is true. Let us live our lives as people who know God and know what love is. And if you've been searching for love, been looking for love, and hopefully not in all the wrong places, uh, <laughs> if you're looking for love and you're looking for the truth and what is right in the world, then what you've been really looking for is Jesus this whole time. And if you believe in him and you repent of your sins, 
to change your heart toward God and you're willing to be baptized in commitment to him, then God has promised to forgive us for all of our mistakes, that we will receive the gift of his Holy Spirit and receive eternal life. That is something that you want to do today. I encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.